Good morning, Baker students. It is Sunday, January 8th, so I hope everyone had, had a good weekend. It was good to see the Chiefs get a win, so I was happy with that. Maximize my utility, at least. So, anyway, I hope they have a uh, good run in the playoffs and make it to the Super Bowl. So, for this week, um, you're going to be reading Chapters 4 and 5. Uh, continue with the Econ Lab. Uh, you're allowed to, um, unlimited attempts on the Econ Lab. Uh, it's up to you if you want to keep trying to get to the 100%. And then uh, engage in the forum discussion. Uh, good job with forum discussion this past week. Uh, had really good um, post, and uh, I think I was able to get to everyone. Uh, as I mentioned going forward, as I kind of get busier at State Tech, I may not have as much time. Uh, in fact, I'll be going back tonight and doing more uh, preparation just during the week uh, for a project management class and a management class uh, later tonight. So either anyway. Um, I will try to get to as many more posts as I can, but it might kind of like divide half the class one week, respond to half of you, and then get the other half the, the following week. So, but good job, everyone, with the forum discussion. Just keep up what you're doing. So, with that, I want to give you a little bit of insights into week two. So, for week two, uh, the first thing you're going to read about is consumer surplus and producer surplus. So, first, uh, the concept of consumer surplus. Um, this was actually not thought of first by an economist who was actually a French engineer. I remember studying this in graduate school many years ago, about 30 years ago, by a guy named Charles Dupuy, who kind of begged the question about how much would people be willing to pay over a toll bridge, and at what point would they take an alternative route? So, you know, I think if you were going out to Lawrence, Kansas for a basketball game, you could take the, uh, the, uh, the I-70, the turnpike, and you may say, you know what, if it gets too expensive, uh, I'll just take the back roads. And, um, we'll, you know, it's kind of a choice about I'm going to get there a little bit slower. But, you know, there are thresholds. And, and the way I want you to think of this, you know, about under a demand curve, there's, uh, I want you to think of the consumer surplus as the area under the demand curve, but above the price. And, and you'll see it in the textbook, the readings, or what is it, PowerPoint. We can calculate that consumer surplus as an area of a triangle, one half base times height. But... Why we're interested in consumer surplus, and we'll see this later in the course too, is there is a price that some people face, say like you go to McDonald's and you buy a Big Mac, and I don't know what a Big Mac is. Uh, do, do get your Big Mac uh, sack, you get buy one, get one free tomorrow, and participate against any area if you're in that area. But let's say a regular Big Mac is $5, and somebody was willing to pay $7 for it, they would have $2 in consumer surplus. So think of the difference as between what you're willing to pay and what you actually had to pay as that consumer surplus. We can see that changes along the demand curve too. The same with producer surplus. Um, think of it as the area above the supply curve, but below the price. So uh, I always use the example about somebody willing to paint my house. You know, say I was willing to pay uh, somebody up to $4,000 to paint my house, and they were willing to do it for 3,000, well, they would have $1,000 of producer surplus. So obviously the price uh, far exceeded what they were willing to do it for. So you're going to look at those things in those two market structures. And then what you're going to look at is um, you know, what happens when there's a, a market failure, when, when the market fails to get to the optimal level of production. Um, government failure says that they intervene, they just make things worse off. And, and sometimes that happens, especially with uh, price floors and price ceilings. But you're going to look at how like taxes or incentives um, can correct to get to that ideal level of output of efficiency in the economy. And a lot of times these are due to things such as externalities, whether they be negative externalities, they could be pollution you're trying to eliminate. A great example, uh, if you're in the market for an electric car this year, there is a $7,500 tax credit. So I want you to think of that as like, well, why are they making people want people to buy electric cars? They're trying to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emissions, the pollutants in the environment. So what you're doing essentially is you're shifting the demand curve out to the right by the amount of that tax. And we should, in theory, see a lot more people buying electric cars. Say you've got a $40,000 electric car and there's a $7,500 tax credit. That's essentially lowering your price by the difference, the $40,000 minus the $7,500. So... Uh, it lowers the price of the car, and you're more likely to buy the car. So the government will try to put policies out there. You can read about cap and trade and others. But, um, you know, it is um, 
th there is a lot of inefficiency, especially with the negative externalities. That, that cannot not be denied. I was watching a special in 60 Minutes the uh, last week. It was talking about how um, this one Stanford biologist and his colleagues were predicting back in the 70s how, how we're actually we're kind of overpopulated in the world. And, you know, the, the reality is that our world was only built probably to sustain about 2.5 billion people. And uh, right now we're approaching like 8 billion people. And we're just reusing the resources and creating more pollution at a rate that we cannot sustain. And the fortunate problem right now is there's really no political will. You can look at the Paris uh, Agreement, but nobody holds to it. So we still continue to put a lot of pollutants in the environment. Uh, we overfish. They, they gave an example of uh, in Washington where these native tribes have fished for years and now there, there's no fish left. So uh, you're going to read a little bit uh, more in the next chapter about uh, different types of goods, whether it's public goods or uh, common resources. And really, you can't exclude anyone. It's hard to you know, keep people up from fishing in the ocean. You know, it's uh, non-rival and it's non-excludable, so it's hard to do those things. But nonetheless, you know, uh, going back to these... Uh, Stanford biologists, you know, that what they predicted in the 70s is pretty much coming true. The one thing they predicted wrong, and including Robert Malthus, who is a uh, classical economist, he was worried about, you know, you got this population that keeps growing, and you have, um, it's growing at an exponential rate, and food's growing at an uh, arithmetic rate, um, and they say, hey, we're going to run out of food someday. Well, what Robert Malthus and what the Stanford economists, the non economists, Stanford biologists, don't you know, take into consideration is that we've improved our ways of production, that we can now produce uh, more food um, with all the new technologies. You know, it's not a matter of, we, we can produce enough food for the world, it's a matter of distribution and who gets it. Uh, but there's other uh, negative externalities. If you kind of see what's happened to Lake Mead and uh, the water in the West, you know, then Lake Mead's kind of disappearing. So, uh, one of the most expensive things in the future is going to be fresh water, I believe. So, all right. So you're going to read about that. And then uh, in the next uh, chapter, uh, with the externalities, you're going to spend a lot of time with that and try to look at these market failures and how the government um, puts things in place to try to correct for these uh, failures. So anyway, I am uh, looking forward to reading your forum post this week. If you do have any questions, do email me. But otherwise, uh, just uh, keep plugging away and have a great week. Uh, talk to you online.